Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all out this morning. I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, that's an odd reading for a Christmas series. Let me just read you this from the beginning of uh, Matthew's Gospel, and we'll get into why we read that this morning. This is Matthew chapter 1, the first few verses. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. Um, I'm sure many of you will have seen it, and if you haven't seen it, you've probably at least heard of the program. Um, I can't remember which channel it was on, uh, but uh, the program, Who Do You Think You Are? I'm sure many of you have probably seen that program, where they, they investigate the family tree of, of a celebrity or some well-known TV personality to discover who, what, who was in their family, where have they come from, what was their family like? And there's a, an equivalent uh, program in the US called, family, called Finding Your Roots. And in 2015, this, this equivalent program in the US, Finding Your Roots, they did uh, an episode on the actor Ben Affleck. Um, you'll know Ben Affleck uh, for murdering various superhero franchises. Um, but apart from that, he was also well regard- he's also well regarded as something as a social justice warrior. He's well known for his charitable work and his work amongst equality groups and the like. So when the TV program, when the research team um, for Finding Your Roots, when they discovered that one of his relatives was a wealthy slave owner from Georgia, he wasn't very keen on that segment being included in the TV program when it aired on TV. And so he he wrote uh, quietly to the producers and the editors, and he asked them to leave that bit of his family record out. Please don't put that bit on the telly. And his request was granted and the show was re-edited and it was aired without ever mentioning that relative from Georgia. But by the very fact that I'm telling you this story now, you know that these things never stay quiet, do they? They never stay hidden and eventually the segment came to light and it caused something of a controversy as you can imagine. In the original segment that never aired but has now been seen, uh, when he was confronted with the fact that he was related to a slave owner and and he was asked how he felt about that and he said, it gives me a kind of sagging feeling that I'm biologically related to that. He said, knowing that slave owners are in his family left a bad taste in his mouth. Ben Affleck didn't want to be associated with a man who would own slaves. He didn't want it to be known that a man who would act like that was related to him. Essentially, he didn't want to accept his ancestors and and their sins as part of his family, and so he he disowned them. Perhaps we understand his request. Uh, Perhaps we understand his embarrassment. Perhaps we can understand him wanting to dissociate himself from something as vile and wicked as the slave trade. And particularly, maybe we can understand it as somebody who is in quite a high-profile position, that someone like that would want to control what people know about his family's past because of how it would reflect on him. What about God then? People don't come much more high-profile than the Lord Almighty. What about the people who are included in his family line, in the line of Jesus, in the earthly line of Christ? How does God conduct his PR? Well, it's very differently. 
For our Christmas series, which we started last Sunday evening, we are looking, we're going through the first chapter of Matthew. Uh, we're looking at what we might call the forgotten chapter of, Chris, of the Christmas story. It's the genealogy of Jesus. I read the first few verses there. It's basically Jesus' family tree. It's Jesus' episode of Who Do You Think You Are? It's a long list of names that starts with Abraham, moves on to David, where we just finished, but ultimately ends with Jesus. And in between, there are names that we recognize, such as Jacob and Solomon and Jehoshaphat. And there are many we've never heard of, such as Hezron and Abiud and Azor. And the structure is simple as we go through Matthew. It's so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, who was the father of so-and-so. And on the list goes one name after another. The listing of the generations of the Hebrew people, from their father Abraham Right the way down to their Messiah, Jesus Christ. If any of you are familiar with the King James Version uh, of the Bible, you'll know that instead of using the phrase, the father of, they use that good old-fashioned word, uh, begat. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judah, and, and so on. Well, coming home from Sunday school uh, one December morning, one little boy was asked by his mother what he'd learnt that day in, in class. To which he replied, well, mummy, I, I learnt all of the forgots of the Bible. <laughs> what do you mean? His mum asked. You know, Abraham forgot Isaac, Isaac forgot Jacob, and <laughs> Jacob forgot Judah, and, and on he went. Sometimes we can think of Matthew chapter 1 as the forgottens of the Bible. Uh, the idea that we get to the beginning of Matthew, we've finished the Old Testament, we're moving on to the good stuff now in the New Testament. We're getting to Jesus, we're graduating from the Old Testament. We can, we can forget all that that's come before and that God that we've learned about in the Old Testament. We've got the, we've got the new stuff now. We can sometimes think that way, can't we? We're rolling right on through, but that's not the way that God sees it at all. In fact, far from that, uh, this list at the beginning of Matthew is put there to remind us that everything that's gone before is what has led us to this point. This list of names is something that far from God wanting to forget, he wants us to remember. And he's recorded it precisely because he wants us to remember it. God stops us in our tracks right before the account of the birth of his son and says here, look, this is his earthly lineage. These are the people who are in his family. It's not a lineage that Ben Affleck would want to remember. Because if we study these names in detail, it's almost as if God has intentionally pulled together a rogues gallery. As I've said, we don't know every name in this list, but the ones we do know about, nearly all of them had notable moral failures in their spiritual resumes. For instance, Abraham, he, he lied about his wife Sarah and, and almost gave, him away, gave her away to another man. Isaac did the same thing. Jacob was a cheater. Judah was a fornicator. David was an adulterer. And Solomon was a polygamist. Manasseh was the most evil king Israel ever had, and, and on and on the list goes. This is not a list of plaster saints, this is not a list of perfect people, far from it. Many of them weren't saints at all. The best of these men had flaws, and some of them were so flawed, it was almost impossible to see their good points. Why does God proudly Remember and display these names in the lineage of his son, where others would want to keep it such a secret. What is God showing us by including these people and these names in his family tree? Simply he's showing us his grace. A murderer is on the list. A fornicator is on the list. An adulterer is on the list. A liar is on the list. A deceiver is on the list. Think about that. Most of these men were very great sinners. That God would not erase these people from his family is all of grace. But just as interestingly, it is not just that this list contains uh, some bad men, uh, but it's interesting that it 
it contains women at all. Uh, we have to understand that ordinarily women did not usually make it onto a Jewish genealogy. The line was nearly always traced from father to son. And so the fact that there are women in this list again tells us something crucial and important about who God is and about God's family. Matthew chapter 1 includes four women in Jesus' family tree. They are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. These we are calling the mothers of Christmas. And this week we come to the mother of Christmas, Rahab. Or, as she's most commonly referred to with her little title in scripture, Rahab the harlot. Rahab the prostitute. We might think, hang on a minute. A mother of Christmas Rahab the prostitute. Christmas, the the birth of Jesus, the most perfect, innocent one ever, and a prostitute. It's quite a rich combination, isn't it? Perhaps it makes us feel slightly uncomfortable talking about these things together, linking Jesus to such people and such activities. But we've heard her story read. Let's just hear what what it is saying to us, and let's see how her story brings us to the babe in the manger. You see, another remarkable thing is that Rahab wasn't even an Israelite. But her story has gone down in their history because she played such an important part in it. Israel, God's chosen people, had escaped Egypt after 400 years in captivity. And then after that, they spent the next 40 years wandering around the wilderness because of their lack of faith. And through those 40 years, they were led by a man called Moses. And then Moses died, and another leader was raised up by God. God appointed another man called Joshua, who was chosen to lead his people. And it was to Joshua that God gave the instruction to finally and at last cross the Jordan, go into the promised land, uh, take the land of Canaan, enter the land of Canaan. Canaan was the land that God had promised their, their forefather Abraham hundreds of years ago. And at last, they were to cross the Jordan, they were to see that promise fulfilled, and to take the land from God's enemies, which involved destroying the enemies in the land, destroying all the people who stood against God, who opposed God, who rejected him. And the first city they came across was right across the river, the city, the walled city of Jericho. It was a major city, had tall and strong walls. And so as they were planning how to do this, as they were waiting on instruction from the Lord, Joshua sends two men into the city to spy out the city, to get some information, to learn about them, to see what their forces are like. And so these two spies, we assume, uh, looking for a place to lay low, find themselves in Rahab's house, that quiet corner of the city. Rahab's house obviously wasn't a tea room. It wasn't even a bed and breakfast. It wasn't even really a home. It was a brothel. And Rahab was the lady of the house. It's the sort of place you go where nobody really asks too many questions. But one way or another, Rahab knew who these men were. And by the way, so did the king. They weren't very good spies. Uh, The king knew they were there and he's looking for them. And so Rahab, she knows that these men are in trouble. Uh, These men of the enemy are in trouble. And so what does she decide to do? She decides to help them. She decides to hide them. She takes them up on the roof of her house, which is on the in the wall of the city, and she hides them. And then she goes one step further. When the soldiers eventually come, she lies for them and tells the guards that, well, these men they were here, but they fled the city. You better you better go quickly if you're going to catch them. So Rahab, a Canaanite prostitute, helps out the people of God. But why? Why? In doing this, she would have put herself, her business, her family in serious danger from the king of Jericho. Why would she do that? Let's just read again from Joshua uh, chapter 2 verse 8, that section we read. I just want to read from verse 8. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, listen to what she says, I know that the Lord, 
the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all inhabitants of the land will melt away before you. I know this is going to happen. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. That was 40 years ago. And, and, we, and, I've heard, and I know what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, why? Because the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, because of this, because that is all true, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save me alive by my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. Why did Rahab hide the spies? Faith. Faith. You'll remember just a few weeks ago in the evening we were doing our series through the five solas and we looked at that solar, solar fide, faith alone. And we saw that faith has three components. Knowledge, assent and trust. Rahab had knowledge of who the Israelites were. She had knowledge of their God. But more than that, she assented to that knowledge. She, in other words, she believed it. She believed in this God. Look at verse 10. She doesn't call him their God. She says, the Lord. Not your Lord, the Lord. She believed he was the God of heaven and earth below, that he did have all power, and that only in him could anyone be saved. She believed that truly the Israelites were the people of God and that he is who he said he was and that the only way to be saved was to be in their number. She had knowledge of this. She had a sense. She believed in this. And now she finally is able to trust. She trusted in this God. She acted on that belief. She acted on that knowledge of what she'd heard of this God and what she'd seen of this God and what she believed that this God could do. She now trusted it to be true. She put her money where her mouth was and entrusted her life to this God of the Israelites. It was faith in God that caused her to act this way. I will save you, she says. I will All I ask is that you will spare me because I believe in the Lord. I believe he is right. I believe he is powerful. I believe he is the one true king. And so I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. and I'm going to save you guys because I believe this is what God wants. Sure, there was real danger for Rahab in defying the king of Jericho. But that was nothing in her mind and in reality that was nothing compared to defying the king of the universe, the Lord God of Israel. She had faith that it was this God, the God of Israel, in which she would finally find refuge and safety. Not the walls of Jericho, the very walls she literally lived in. Rahab, the prostitute, was a woman of faith. It was her faith that saved her. Later on in the Bible, if you go through to Hebrews chapter 11, many of you will know this chapter in the Bible. It is a chapter in the Bible which lists some of the greatest people and acts of faith. And it says this about Rahab. By faith. Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Here, in one of the greatest chapters in the Bible on, on faith, as clear as day, Rahab the prostitute is held up as a woman of faith, as a woman who had faith. She's named right alongside the likes of Moses, Abraham and Noah. It was by faith that she hid the spies. 
And Hebrews makes it very clear that it's because of that faith, that act of faith, that faith in God, it was because of that faith that she was not killed. It was her faith that saved her, not her actions. She was saved not because of anything good she'd done with her life. It was very clear, isn't it, that really she had done very little that was good or pure. She hadn't been a devout Israelite who'd kept all the laws. She hadn't been around about the tabernacle offering sacrifices. It was none of those things that saved her. She was a Canaanite. And she was a prostitute. And yet, she had saving faith. How does the story of Rahab lead us to the babe in the manger? Well, let's begin by saying Matthew chapter 1 means nothing. And it tells us nothing if God isn't sovereign. If God isn't sovereign, then the names in Matthew chapter 1 are just what happened. Is they tell us nothing about who God is. If God is not sovereign, it, it, it tells us nothing of what God's like. It just tells us that these are the names that just happen to be in the line of Jesus. And, well, now we'll get on with it. But because the Bible teaches us that God is sovereign, that is, that he plans everything, that tells us that this list of names is not an accident. But it's been planned. It didn't happen by chance. It's the way God planned it to be. God planned that Rahab, a Canaanite prostitute, would be one of the mothers of Christmas we are thinking about this morning. And he had Matthew record it for us so that we would know that. Because God wants you to know, God wants you to know this morning, that this is exactly the kind of person who is welcoming his family. The person who is an enemy of God. The person who is irreligious. The person who is a complete moral failure. That person is the person who God records as being in his family. In the Christmas story, we, we see that the Son of God was not born into a wealthy, political, well-to-do couple, was he? He was not raised in a capital somewhere, in a fancy building with the benefits of wealth and connection and a squeaky clean lineage. He was born in a borrowed stable, in a, a hometown which wasn't even his hometown, a place there was no place for him. Born to a mother with, of simple means amongst questionable moral speculation. The God of the universe, creator and sustainer of all things, not only descended to become part of his creation, but he even joined himself at the very lowest part of that creation. And the inclusion of Rahab in this list reminds us once again that God came down. God came down. You see, we so often think that we must earn our way. We must earn our way into God's love and affection, that we must pray enough, that we must be good enough, worship enough, be devout enough, serve enough. And then if we do all that, then we can just pile up these good deeds and reach our way to God with our worthiness. Oh, but this is just not so. It's not true. Our deeds are never enough, will never be enough, cannot ever be enough. So how do we get to God? We don't. He comes to us. God comes down. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's the babe, the, the babe in the manger is the God of the universe, that, that he came down, that he made himself weak and small and vulnerable so that he could join us in the mess of our lives and save us from our sin. And the question we face is the same as Rahab. Do you have faith in this God? 
You see, there is a day coming where Jesus has come, and there is a day coming where Jesus is coming again. It's his second coming, is what we call it, or his return. We also call it Judgment Day, because on that day, God will judge all the earth. All people will be judged on that day, and any and all who reject the name of Jesus will be cast into eternal judgment. This is the picture we see of Jericho, the enemies of God. Their walls come tumbling down. This is what Rahab faced. She knew she was an enemy of God. She was a Canaanite. And she knew God was coming to deal destructive judgment. What could she do to save herself? Nothing. Nothing but cast herself upon the God of salvation. What can you do to save yourself? Nothing. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing I can do. And to some, that is a frightening thought. We lose control. But the glory of that answer is that there is one who has come to save you. His name is Jesus. Cast yourself upon him. Put your faith and trust in him. Rahab had faith and it saved her. You too can be saved by nothing more than your faith in the one who saves. Jesus, God come down, God with us. Emmanuel. Matthew gives us the lineage of Jesus and it's got some colourful characters. And to that we say, thank God. Because if it was only the squeaky clean ones that were on the list, well, that would box me out of the kingdom straight away. And I think it would box many of, many of us out of the kingdom if that was the standard. Maybe you think this morning that you're stuck because the best you have to offer is absolutely worthless. Well, that's okay. It's true, what you, the best you have to offer is worthless, but that's okay. Because it isn't about what you have to offer, but it's about what Christ has offered you. Rahab's greatest act of faith, just think about this. The thing that gets her listed, her greatest act of faith was to lie. I find that incredibly comforting. Because I know that even my best attempts at faithfulness are soaked with pride and self-serving and sin. The thing that she did that was most faithful was a lie. There is sin in my every motive. And so I must rest on faith. That's all I have. That's all you have too. I have found what Rahab found. I have found that my only refuge is faith. Faith in Jesus. Faith in the God who came down. That word made flesh. God loves those with colourful pasts. He adores them. He comes for them. He redeems them. And he uses them for his kingdom. This is the best Christmas news that Matthew 1 proclaims to us. If God came for Rahab, then boy, he came for you and me as well. And that is absolutely bright and merry news this Christmas. Jesus never says, it gives me a kind of sagging feeling to see that I'm biologically related to that. He never says that. He never says, having dug in my family leaves a bad taste in my mouth. He never says that. He'd have have every reason to, by the way. But instead, he embraces the outcast. He embraces the failure. And he wants the world to know about it. Don't think that you're beyond the grace of Christmas. Beyond the grace of Christ this Christmas. 
Don't believe that you are too bad. Don't believe that you are too damaged to be loved by Jesus because that is is exactly for those reasons that he loves you and that he came and that he ultimately died and rose again. Matthew chapter 1 takes us from the house of ill repute in Jericho to Bethlehem, the house of bread, where Jesus, the bread of life, is laid in a manger, in a feeding trough. It takes us from the woman who would give her body for a price to the man, the one who would lay down his life for free, that all, may, that all who would have faith in him may live. The story of Rahab shows us once again that Christmas is amazing, it's over the top, and it's completely unexpected. Come to know the God who came down to you. Come to know him this Christmas. He may t- turn up in the most unexpected of places. Soli Deo Gloria. Amen.